Gold and silver are absolutely taking off right now. Seems like we're certainly in the middle of some type of a global currency crisis mixed with an energy crisis, mixed with a geopolitical crisis. And I can't say I'm excited about it at all. It's not good. But this is what we've been talking about on the channel for a long time. These types of things were coming and there were ways to profit from it. And there are going to be ways to profit of it. At the end of the day, all of this happening, it's a wealth transfer. And one of the beneficiaries of that wealth transfer is commodities and silver specifically. And here to talk about all of that happening right now and silver specifically is my friend, Mike Connor. He is the CEO of Vizla Silver, traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And we're gonna be breaking down what's happening in the global financial markets, how this could affect silver moving forward. And we're gonna be talking a bit about Vizla. So make sure you hit the like button on this video, send it out in the YouTube universe, comment down below, go silver, go, or give us your silver price predictions right there down below in the comments. And uh, it's good to see you, Mike. You too, Jake. It's, uh, it's always good to catch up. And um, I mean, what a what a crazy day for metals today. And, you know, maybe I'll make it a little explanation here. I'm, I'm on the road marketing Vizsla right now. And that's why my uh, background is the Panuco project, not uh, the, uh, you know, the dark hotel room behind me. So... <laughs> It looks good though. I told you, you look like you're actually in uh, in Mexico right now. Um, so yeah, it's been a, today as the time of us recording this, it is March 8th, March 8th and gold is uh, at $2,051. It was up as high as I think about 4% today. Mm -hmm. You're really starting to see the wheels fall off all of this stuff and silver starting to move quite substantially. Uh, what do you make of all of it? Well, it's just like what we've been talking about for the last two years or so. Um, you know, uh, I, I looked at Bitcoin price as well, too. And, you know, the, the whole argument was that, you know, we didn't need gold anymore, or commodities anymore, that, uh, you know, the currency, the cryptocurrency would be the safe haven. And it's shown now that it, that really isn't true. I mean, look at uh, look at gold. I think this is just the very first bit of a move uh, for gold and, and, you know, in, in, uh, in conjunction with that silver, silver always lags a little bit. So, you know, there's an opportunity when you see gold moving, you can, you can buy silver and you can benefit from that. It's kind of a leading indicator, but, um, you know, this is exactly how, um, you know, we thought these things would play out. You have some geopolitical instability. Um, we're also in the middle of a, an everything, a molecule crisis, as, as Jeff Curry says from, uh, Goldman Sachs, it's, it's not gold. It's not silver. It's it's not just those metals. It's copper. It's nickel. Um, you know, it's tin. It's it's uh, basically anything that you can't make digitally um, is going to be in higher demand. And and you know these these supply shocks are only emphasizing that. I never heard that before. A molecule crisis. That's uh, pretty crazy. I was talking to um, Willem uh, Metalcope today and. He was talking about, I believe it was nickel. Um, they had to stop the trading on it. And you're seeing these incredible things. So this is the exact scenario of when you started Vizsla years ago. I, I think maybe you bought your project when, I don't know, maybe silver is like 14, 15 bucks. You guys have been an incredible success story, you know, up, I don't know what it is since, since you guys IPO'd. I don't know if it's a thousand percent or whatever it is. You guys are up a lot. You guys have been a great success story. You got listed in the New York Stock Exchange. You guys have been one of our sponsors. You know, a lot of people have, including myself, uh, have, you know, been a very happy shareholder that has done very well. You guys were one of the companies that after Silver Squeeze, most silver stocks went the opposite way. They were down 30, 40% for a while. And you guys were actually up during that time because great news and great progress. But you guys had a, a news release um, recently that was a correction um, through like some type of a, of, a, of a miscalculation error on one of your projects. Um, you guys had a little, uh, you know, maybe I forget what it was, 8, 10% um, sell off. You guys rebounded quite well. Seems like all your big investors understand it well and are very happy with it. You know, and I also saw some comments, of people asking to explain uh, what had happened. So can you give everyone a breakdown? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with Visla, some of our core tenants are, you know, first of all, it's extreme ownership. We, you know, when something like this happens, the buck stops with management. You know, I, I'll take responsibility and ownership for, for you know, the the recalculate the miscalculation, I suppose, and the uh, the re-release of that news. Um, and then the other thing that, that's very important to us is transparency. So, um, you know, what happened there was we had a, a third-party consultant uh, calculate our resources based on the recent drilling. Um, you know, it, it passed through a few levels of, uh, of due diligence on our side, on the management side, and somehow we we missed a, a calculation or arithmetic error on the spreadsheet that overcompensated the amount of base metals in the silver equivalent uh, calculation. So it was uh, artificially inflated slightly. Um, we caught that the day, you know, the same day that we released it, we, we you know, re- reviewed it, caught it, and um, subsequently had to put a re-release out. Now, um, <clears throat> that release uh, that we put out, the, the, the final number there is an incredible number, you know, over basically 106 million ounces of combined uh, silver equivalent uh, in a resource in 18 months of drilling from discovery, really just an incredible um, performance by our team. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit sad that, uh, that the team doesn't get the glory uh, necessarily for that, uh, that amazing outcome because they should. Um, but you know what, all of our investors, everybody that I'm talking to today in our meetings in Toronto and I'm going to New York and then we're, we're doing a you know, very long roadshow here to, uh, to talk about Visla to investors. Everybody understands. Um, as a matter of fact, many of them see it as a buying opportunity. You know, it doesn't change anything about the project. And, um, you know, it's a fantastic outcome for us. So we're going to move on from, um, you know, from that mistake. It, you know, it wasn't easy to, to own up to it and take it on the chin, but that's what we have to do. And, and uh, I think the project is just going to continue to get better and better. So for us, you know, uh, insiders put their money where their mouth was. We bought over $300,000 of stock in the last week. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to support the company. So uh, all in all, um, explain to explain to someone um, how the vision of the company is is intact and 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 moving forward. Well, first of all, Visla is very well financed. We have over thirty eight million dollars in Canadian dollars in the bank right now. We have um, you know one hundred and twenty thousand meters of drilling. So. In order to to put this resource together, which is a really an industry leading made in resource, you don't see this very often. In some cases, it's twice, you know, the um, the the made in resource for many kind of silver companies in in Mexico. So we blew it out of the water, um, and that just shows how quality this asset is, how big Napoleon, our, our major vein there is, Tejitos, Copala. These veins have just um, given us more than we expected. And each of those parts of the resource are actually open for expansion with further drilling. So in order for us to have gotten to this number, we drilled 125,000 meters, so 125 kilometers of core into um, into these veins. And uh, we're going to do the same amount um, this year. So the resource is going to grow. We're going to make new discoveries. And as we do that, we're moving closer and closer to, to production. And so in order to go into production, we needed this resource to actually understand how to plan the mine. And so this is that first major milestone towards that. Now, the people that I talked to and the investors that we've been speaking to have all been very excited with this, this outcome here. And, and uh, to, to reiterate, nothing's changed about the project other than it's gotten better. It was just an arithmetic uh, mistake. So um, right now we're seeing all of this stuff unfold with with Russia, with Ukraine, and you're seeing a huge, as you said earlier, a molecule crisis. And you're seeing, I mean, whether it's wheat, whether it's nickel, I mean, everything is, you know, it's it's actually quite scary. Um, and one of the things that's going to be interesting out of that, we know silver is in a tiny market. It was about $30 billion uh, market. Yeah. And there's been such a distortion of that market due to the, the paper manipulation of it that, you know, you've already got quite a distorted market, but now whether it's companies like Russia and other companies that are looking to diversify outside of the dollar and they're stacking commodities, gold, silver, whether it's tech companies that need to make sure that they have necessary products. 
as you're watching this unfold, are you saying to yourself, yes, this is exactly why I got involved in silver? Well, you know, the first part of that is that, you know, obviously it's a, it's a kind of a melancholy situation where you're, you're, you know, you're profiting or, or succeeding based on political and, and, and world instability and war and things like that. So you never want to kind of take too much, well, any pleasure in that really, but way that we do this is we've, we've put our foot on these assets as, as almost a way to defend our, our net worth, our, our assets, because we want to own as much hard assets as possible. So, you know, in Vizla, we, we, we bought this project, we're drilling out what could be, you know, an enormous, well, it is an enormous amount of silver, but it could be one of the world's largest districts for, uh, for silver and gold. And, you know, we have ownership of that through that through shares and, you know that's a that's a really you know good way to to do that. But we also have investments in nickel and copper and tin and you know all of these things. I think um, for two reasons. One is that you know there's there's supply disruptions here uh, with Russia. You know even you're talking about natural gas and and uh, and petrol and things like that. You know it's it's going to supply it's going to disrupt the supply and those prices are going to go higher. And that's also what's happening in nickel. There's a major nickel production in in um, in Russia as well. So you have this supply disruption based on uncertainty around borders and sovereign company countries and things like that. But you also have this frenzied demand here where people are going to be buying this because they think it's the price is going to go up and and uh, and you need it. You know, you need metals to to make a Tesla, you need metals to have power in your home, you need metals for for everything and and um you know, I think the world kind of forgot about that and lost sight of that. And now we're seeing a very early stage of this kind of panic towards metals. And I think it's going to become more and more topical. And, um, you know, we've spent the last, I've spent the last over a decade, basically learning everything I could and, and buying as many um, assets really in the metal space, because I, I suspect that this is just the beginning. And, and um, you know, people that, that have owned shares and, and um, assets and metals and are going to do very well in this, this, uh, this new reality that we're in. I was interviewing um, Keith Newmeyer, I think last week, and Keith was breaking down the math on the silver market about how much silver is used annually in electric vehicles, and then doing the math um, to tie into the um, government mandates on electric vehicles by x amount of date and you know the math was just so crazy it was like there was more they needed more just for the electric vehicle mandates it was going to be more than all the silver that's mined annually in a year and it's crazy to think about because in addition to that you also have the financial component where silver is a unique metal in that Keith calls it a strategic metal um, in that there's this incredible projected industrial demand for it between EVs and tech renewables, but also the uh, sound money side of it, because Mm -hmm. we're in this, you know, basically we're at the end of a currency cycle. And so you've got these two perfect storms that are brewing together at the same time which one of those from the EV side and the math on the actual industrial demand versus the sound money currency side, which initially brought you into silver? And then today, which do you think is a more compelling thesis as someone who owns a silver mine? Well, you know, I I suppose the first thing that drew me to it was the sound money side. You know, I consider gold and silver originally when I when I first was interested in this to be, you know, almost quite similar in the sense that silver was just a more accessible, um, uh, you know, way to play gold, really. And then, you know, over that period of time, I suppose, over the last 20 years or so, um, you know, the the applications for silver have, have grown. Um, silver has become far more important in the green economy. And so, you know, recognizing that that was always an opportunity, um, I now look at it and, and, and I'm almost overwhelmed by the the opportunity for, for both of them. And they play into each other in a sense where you have governments spending money, uh, printing money, essentially, that they, you know, they haven't earned their, <laughs> they're, they're printing it to, to stimulate um, 
you know these green economies and and uh, programs that affect you know these these uh, um, these outcomes, and then that's that in turn is very good for sound money as well too. So it's as as you and just and Keith said here, it's a it's a perfect storm. It's it's going to be incredible, and and um, you know. I, I was sitting down with one of my colleagues today and he was saying, oh, when I started with um, a major silver miner, um, you know, my career, silver was $30 and, you know, went down to 15 and now it's on its way back to 30. Of course, it's going to go to 30. And I said, yeah, you're, you're probably right. But that was, you know, a long time ago. And and um, just think about how much more money's in, in, in circulation now. Think about this modern monetary theory. I, I, I could see silver going, you know, multiple times from here. Along with all these other metals, I think copper could go to twelve plus dollars. I think gold will go to, you know, far higher than than uh, you know what we've seen here as a recent high. So, uh, you know, I think sadly, you know, this is the way it's all playing out um, through war and and um, you know and and conflict. But um, it needed a catalyst really to kick this off, and and, uh, and that's what we're seeing here. It's weird because when all the lockdowns happened and then the United States printed like 40% of all currency in, you know, whatever it was, 18 months. And there was the market crash and then all then the subsequent money printing. It was like, everyone kind of woke up for a minute and everyone was like, wow, we need to buy commodities. We need to buy sound money. And then <clears throat> everything just kind of got lulled back to sleep for a while. And everyone's like, yeah, it's fine again. Yeah. And then this happened and everyone's like, actually, it's not fine again. And it, it's interesting to see the cycle of that and how the psychological, uh, how fear is the driver for gold and silver. Um, what's your what's your thoughts on that? I, I agree entirely. Um, whether it's fear of losing, you know, uh, assets or net worth or fear of missing out on profits, fear is going to drive people and then it'll be greed. And you know, speaking of that, you, you know, maybe talking about the the investing public as a whole, you know, felt like they needed more exposure. But right now, we're we're at a position. I know Rick Roll talks about this as well. We're we're in a situation where all of the world's money managers have pretty much zero allocation or zero exposure to any of these these um, these companies. It takes a little while, you know. Right now, there there's probably portfolio managers and asset managers sitting in there thinking, "Oh, we should own some gold." <laughs> You're like, well, okay, well, which company? What about Ignico or B2? What's an Ignico? What's a B2? You know, they don't know. It's <laughs> going to take them a little bit of time to figure that out. And there's probably some 26-year-old guy that's never, you know, never bought a gold stock and only knows crypto and these things. So, you know, there's going to be this great transition um, into into these metals. And, and you know, from what we're seeing now, it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, incredible. It's going to be fantastic to see that because there's just going to be so much money piling into the space. Where do you think it goes from here? I mean, when you're looking at inflation, it is out of control. I mean, it really is out of control. Um, the German producer price index was uh, 30%. Uh, year over year, which is the highest since 1949. I mean, then you're seeing like weed up, like however many percent in a day and this up and that up. And I just wonder where does it all go? I mean, what do you think happens? Well, I think, you know, that there's things like this have happened in, in history in the past. And, and I suppose, you know, there is the undertoes of of uh, end of empire and, you know, things like that, end of currency, um, U.S. back kind of currency and things like that. But, um, uh, you know, I think, you know, eventually these high prices solve themselves because they, they limit demand and it slows inflation, I suppose. But, um, you know, I think it has many, many legs here. There's going to be spikes and there's going to be corrections and spikes and corrections. But overall, I could see the whole commodity complex and, and um, everything that, you know, we invest in, uh, going up multiple, multiple times here, maybe even as much as 10x as a whole. And in that, there's going to be companies like Beesla or others that have success with their underlying assets that go up, you know, multiple times from that. So, you know, it happened before, um, you know, during the the uh, Middle Eastern crisis in you know, 2000, early 2000s, the crash of of um, the, the dot-com um, you know, sector and, and uh, broader markets. And then everybody piled into, Commodities. I think we're a couple of years into something very similar to that. 
but in, in another sense, very similar to the 70s commo uh, commodity bubbles. But these things eventually play out. So it is important to, um, you know, hang in there and, and, and hold on through the corrections, but also identify when, when that top is in. But I think we're maybe as much as 10 years out from that. Yeah, it's crazy to look at how quickly the tides change. You just said, like, hang in there. Um, it just makes it – you see firsthand how important it is to really understand why you're buying something, right? Yeah. Um, I was talking to my friend. He just got back from Tony Robbins' little mastermind group as a financial event. Um, some small group with – Paul Tudor Jones was there and Larry Summers and all these big – billionaire investors that Tony hangs out with. And he's like, he wanted me to go and I ended up not being able to make it. And he's, and he kind of said like, it's a good thing you didn't go because man, they were bearish. The only thing they were bullish on was commodities. Yeah. And you're starting to see that, right? Oh yeah. Well then, and, and you know, the way that most people play that to start is oil, right? So oil is the kind of the most secular commodity. And I, I'm, you know, but from there, it goes down the food chain and, um, you know, people start to find gains where they are. So eventually, you know, I know you talk to a lot of people in, in our sector here, which is the more junior side of, of these companies. And, you know, the way that, that that food chain goes is I think the big, broader oil companies will do very well to start. Then it goes into, you know, maybe the larger copper producers or base metal producers. But, you know, people start to get hungry for for gains, right? And and they find those further down the food chains with um, you know with juniors like companies like like Visa or something between a you know five hundred and a two billion dollar market cap, you know, and and so you know when that happens, uh, there's just so much capital that floods into the market, and and so it's important to identify that um, as well if you're investing in the space, you know, to know what part of the cycle we're in. And, you know, like I said, I feel like we're very early innings. And if you trace some of the old bull markets that you, you can go back and look at, even if you just look at proxies like the XAU and, and um, GDXJ and things like that, you can kind of trace that and see what, what it looked like in the past. But you can also see that in that relative chart where, you know, the, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but the S&P to commodities chart, it's hit like an absolute bottom here. Um, and, uh and I, I think there's a major correction coming for the for the broader markets, and then also a, a you know re-rating and a multiple time re-rating for uh, for commodities here. So it's going to be, you know, it, there there will be like I said, peaks and valleys and ups and downs. But uh, as I as I um, you know as I said, I think this is just the very beginning of something very exciting here. Rick said that about. It's funny you said that because I while you were listening, I recall him saying that about the seventies, like the legendary commodities market that it began with oil, first of all, and then oil catches the flow and then everything else, just all the commodities just keep moving like in a tide. Yeah. And that's the way that, you know, you mentioned those, those money managers, billionaire money managers, they, they don't, no one really wants to stick their, their I was going to say something else, but no one wants to stick their neck out and, um, and uh, you know, get, uh, get the, out there, get too early and be like, Oh, you know, look like an idiot now for buying commodities too soon but when one or two of them do it they all flood in and if you remember like 2020 march 2020 uh warren buffett bought barrick in berkshire and and then never you know oh, it's socially acceptable i can talk about uh i can talk about gold at you know this whatever the university club in new york or wherever it is right and and um you know that that's that's kind of how it goes right so there's a bit of momo there's a bit of momentum in, in all of that and you know when the tastemakers choose oil then it gives a green light for other people to say, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to beat them to copper and then I'm going to beat them to silver. And, and it all kind of, you know, it, it lifts all the, all the boats in this tide. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. I mean, when you, when you factor in the amount of currency debasement and everyone looking for somewhere to put their money, it's going to be interesting to see which, what happens with commodities. I, I surely feel good about where my, uh, where my money is. Uh, I don't know about you. Well, I was actually going to, I was thinking about that before we got on today, but I, you know, and it's sad. I mean, you'd, you know, you don't want there to be war and people, but I mean, it happens, it happens all the time all around the world, but people seem to care particularly because it's Ukraine and now, but um, you know, it happened. I mean, Yemen, there've been people being, um, 
you know, massacred, you know, for years straight here. But, um, you know, you don't want to profit necessarily off of, off of, you know, violence or anything like that. But uh, in a situation where you're worried about hyperinflation and, and um, how is my money going to, you know, am I going to be able to afford a, a house or groceries or whatever it is, you know, if you have your money in gold and, you know, I have, you know, probably 90% of my net worth in, in, uh, in mining stocks and, and, and the like, um, you know, I sleep pretty well at night because of the, the fact that I'm, I think if anything, I need more exposure. That's the thing that keeps me up. I just want more. <laughs> Yeah, it's just um, it's just amazing to see. You know, we've talked about this type of stuff on the channel for the while for a while, but it's exciting and from like a purely financial perspective. But it's as a father, I'm genuinely ter- and as a citizen, I'm genuinely terrified of it. But I guess it's just you've done a good job of focusing on what you can control, and you've directed all your energy into here's a problem. Here's an opportunity. Let me use all my skills and talents and and build a team and company to solve a problem. And you put your energy where you could control. And I guess that's kind of the only thing you can do, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, And the other thing is, I guess, not worry too much because, you know, the world goes through cycles. There's waves of these things that happen. And, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll most likely all make it through. To the next uh, glory days, I suppose, on the other side, where you know everybody's kind of forgotten about commodities again, and and uh, the next speculative thing is 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 hot, and you know every everything's back to normal, I suppose. But um, it, it, things things always go through cycles, and that's that's always what's what's kept me going in commodities as well. Is that you know I I started at the very top when you know I'd be at these conferences in Canada, and there'd be big U.S. bankers walking around trying to buy these. $10 million micro cap, you know, juniors. And I didn't really, I didn't know enough at that point to realize that I was the absolute top, but, uh, um, you know, I, that'll happen again. And, um, and, and, you know, things will kind of, everything comes in waves and cycles. So we're going to rug pull Charlie Munger. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, what's, uh, what's next up for, uh, for for Vizla, uh, I know I'm always poking you in the ribs to tell you you guys got to get to the Lobo Tigres pre-production sweet spot here soon. Yeah. What's uh, what's going on? Well, the miles, you know that uh, that resource is that first first step towards that. So now we we've identified this 13 million ounce core in um, in Napoleon that's a very high grade. It's one of the highest grades in uh, in Mexico. So it's just really quite impressive. And so if we were to look to, to production, you know, that could be a place to start. So now we have that data, that information. And I think that we'll be in a position to to keep pushing towards production. And, and we understand, you know, in, in a price, high price environment, you really want to be out there selling that metal. So, you know, we're, we're, we're um, you know, very fired up about that. The management, the team, you know, we're focused on it. And, um, you know, I think just, just bear with us, but we have to do things the right way through, through um, resources and, and mine planning. Beautiful. All right, Mike. Uh, I know you are busy on a world tour right now on the early stages of your, uh, of your world tour. So we appreciate you joining us. We're going to link the Vizla Silver website right there down below in the description. Uh, Vizla is out on the uh, New York Stock Exchange. We're going to link Vizla Twitter. I'll link Mike's Twitter right there down below. Go ahead and hit the like button on this video. Send it out in the YouTube universe. Comment down below. Go, Silver, go. Right there down below in the comments. You know, us uh, crazy Silver people, it was a little rough going for a while, uh, but you're starting to see you weren't crazy. You, you know, you, you, you understood the thesis of what's happening in the world, and Silver is one of a few important places to be that's going to be a great beneficiary so congratulations to everyone that uh that hung on during that time right mike absolutely good work (laughs) all right so we want to thank you for listening today uh and uh we want to thank mike for joining thanks jake i appreciate it and uh thanks to your your listeners too